My name is Anton Zvedov. I manage communications for the Russian International Affairs Council. And today uh, I'm very honored to be moderating this open lecture we're having. Uh, it is uh, an honor and a privilege to welcome Mr. Richard Weiss, Weiss here in Moscow and at the Russian International Affairs Council. Uh, Mr. Weiss is a senior fellow and director for the Center for Political and Military Analysis at the Hudson Institute. And uh, apart from that, he's a non-resident adjunct senior fellow at the Center for New American Security. And uh, in front of me, I have a long list of uh, books published and co-authored by Mr. Weitz, as well as journals and um, media channels and uh, all kind of, kinds of publications that he has been um, present in. And uh, it gives me great honor to welcome he him here. Um, I'm going to say a couple of words about the people who are present here today. Uh, judging by the registration list we have, um, this team that we have here represents pretty much the foreign policy community in Moscow that exists around the Russian International Affairs Council. So we have people from embassies, from government bodies, from the academia, independent think tanks, um, civil society organizations, the media of course. Uh, and it is great that we can discuss issues put forward today in such a diverse uh, group of people. So um, the format of our uh, interaction today will be very simple. Um, Richard will give us a talk about the issues that were um, put forward and most importantly about trilateral non-proliferation in Russia, China and United States. This triangle, whether there is such a triangle or not, we're going to find out very soon. And then we are going to open the floor for a discussion and communicate with each other in a very free and open manner. Um, I will not be setting any more questions before we should start this talk. Um, the only thing perhaps I would throw in is that when we were translating Richard's um, proposed topic for this discussion, uh, he used non-proliferation cooperation in troubled times. And translating it into Russian, we use the word crisis, which is crisis. So, it's a little stronger. It's a silnier, yes, so, okay, that's all. So, so this, 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 this will be a very nice uh, curveball for you yeah. to figure out whether it's, and tell us what is your opinion about whether it's just trouble or is it a crisis. Okay. So, Richard, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. I thank you very much for coming. Um, I, I appreciate that. I want to thank Riet for hosting me. I want to thank Rethinking Russia, which brought me to Moscow. They had a conference a couple days ago. I thought it was very interesting. We talked about the interface between um, political action and political ideologies and ideas and um, how Russia, putting Russia in comparative perspective with the other Western democracies. So I thought, I thought it was very insightful and I know they're going to continue working on developing their ideas. So that will be more opportunities for us to learn from that. Um, I want to uh, thank the MacArthur Foundation, which is supporting my research on Russia, China, and U.S. relationship, particularly trying to promote non-proliferation cooperation between the three countries. Um, and я разучился говорить по-русски, но все еще понимаю. So if, if you still, if you want to, if you if you prefer, it's up to you. You're welcome to ask me a question in Russian, or if you want to make comments, which is also helpful for us, feel free to do that in Russian as well. And, and along those lines, though, my talk is on uh, non-proliferation. We can. If, if the moderator permits, we can talk about anything you want, really. You want to talk about Donald Trump, you want to talk about you know, Syria. I'm, I'm happy, to, I'm here to learn, so anything that we can talk about is, is fine with me. Um, I, would, I wouldn't call the trilateral relationship a crisis. And I wouldn't even say that the non-proliferation regime itself is in, in crisis. It's under a lot of strain. Um, but, I mean, I'm glad you asked me that. You made me think, just sticking back and looking at the whole picture where we are, we still got fairly good relations at, when focusing on specific proliferation problems, particularly Iran and North Korea, despite the tensions between uh, Russia and the United States over uh, Ukraine and other issues, NATO enlargement, and despite the tensions between China and the United States States over you know, your, your expertise, uh, the, the, uh, the, the whole maritime disputes and East and, and South China, uh, China seas. Um, 
for the most part, especially when you talk to the American diplomats and, I, and whenever I get a chance to Russian and Chinese equivalents, they're satisfied with their relationship. I mean, the, pro, the, the, the complexity is these are really difficult problems. So even if the United States and Russia and China can agree, you know, we don't want North Korea to have nuclear weapons, well, then there's a problem how you get there and, and, and how do you get the, 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 the party that you want in Pyongyang to influence. And, and Russia has been more successful than most of us in me only engage Pyongyang, but still hasn't gained the kind of leverage which would be needed to really force a change in decision there. Um, it, somewhat like Syria, and even if I think if Russia and the U.S. can come to a peace agreement, that, that's, you're still missing some key actors there, but we can talk about that if you want later. Um, and so if you... Now, the reason why I'm focusing on the, the Russia, the U.S., and China, um, I think we all, we all see that in, in many areas of the world they are still the most important, or at least among the most important countries. Uh, and I think for non-proliferation, that this is especially true, that uh, for if you consider which of their countries' military actions have the most effect on proliferation dynamics, I mean, the United States on one level has given a lot of security guarantees to countries, which Americans argue, I think, correctly, uh, helps prevent them from developing their own nuclear weapons. I'm thinking in particular uh, South Korea at one time, Germany, maybe in the future uh, some um, Gulf states through extended insurance. Um, and uh, conversely, there are countries that are uh, at times have sought or considered thinking getting nuclear weapons out of concern about the United States, I think particularly Iran and North Korea. Uh, in the case of Russia, it's clear that you know Russia's if 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 Russia does not uh, it, it does not cooperate with the U.S. or at least you know, we don't agree on the, what outcome we want to achieve on certain of these critical issues, uh, we won't get positive results. And, and conversely, uh, if it wasn't for Russia's support in the case of Iran deal, and then Secretary Kerry and I think President Obama have said this, uh, we wouldn't have gotten it. So it was it was absolutely critical for the Russia role Russia played in those negotiations. Despite the fact, I think we understand Russia was a bit cross pressured on. There, there are costs to Russia of a deal, and there are benefits from Russia of the deal, and you, know, you could have argued either way. So it was, it was, a, it was, a, it was, it was. A, I think at least the American diplomats were surprised by how much cooperation they got from Russia and from Europe. They were kind of surprised by how strongly the Europeans stood behind the sanctions, uh, which um, you know didn't really cost the U.S. anything since we had no economic ties to the But it did cost the Germans and the French and others a lot of money to enforce those. And China. Uh, is important, increasingly so. We've got a more assertive Chinese leadership, whereas in the past I think they would have just gone along with if the Russian and the U.S. could come to an agreement on something, the Chinese wouldn't try and stand in the way. Now, um, in particularly in the case of North Korea, but Iran, other areas, they could, they're out there uh, playing important roles in promoting non-proliferation in the case of Iran and trying to grapple with the North Korea problem, which we are all struggling with. And there are other domains, uh, particularly in terms of our civilian nuclear industries that are very important for if we can get safe and secure nuclear energy deals that will help counter non-proliferation. And conversely, if we're not careful, our, our, we could contribute to that. Um, I thought I will focus a bit on the Iran deal and Korea. Um, and and in one, more quickly, we can mention some of the other areas because I, I just th those are the two that I want to cover in the because uh, I don't want to take too much time because I'm really interested in your views on these. Um, the Iran deal, it's it's quite obvious that we're going to need continue Russia, China, uh, U.S. cooperation to see it go forward. I mean, the three countries stood firm and I think that helped to persuade the Iranians to agree to the terms of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the GCPOA. I don't even know what the Russian acronym is, but uh, but you, I mean, we, we, you, you presumably, you know, you, you know the term since you're all, you're all familiar with this. Basically, you have Iranian cut back a lot of its uh, enriched Iranian stockpiles on its capacity to enrich uranium to remake its plutonium reactor. The Chinese are playing a critical role in that. Russia has played a critical role in, in dealing with the U uranium stockpiles of the Iran uh, the, of the uh, uh, loanish uranium in, in return for other, I think it was yellow cake in return. Um, there's uh, 
in return the relaxation of sanctions it's difficult for the US to uh, relax all the sanctions so I'm not sure if the Iranians thought they would get a lot of trade or investment from the United States um, I, I think they understood that that wasn't going to happen I think their key benefit from the deal in terms of the US is you don't have the US Treasury go around to India or South Korea or Europe and say you know you trade with Iran you're, you know, we're going to pour all these sanction on to you. The U.S. has stopped doing that, and so that gives Iran benefits from the other countries. Um, but there's some things the U.S. still can't do, uh, which Russia and China can, uh, making sure that as Iran develops a civilian nuclear energy that is proliferation resistant, but also safe and secure. I mean, Boucher is a bit of a mess since we've had a series of countries take over and try and put that together, start off with the Germans and so on, so there's, always, there's a little question about how safe that is but any future system, we want to make sure that, that it's got Russian or Chinese or some advanced uh, expertise looking at it to make sure that it's safe. Um, and in terms of what to do with the spent fuel, I mean, Russia's got a great take-back arrangement in which Russia gives Iran the fuel and then take from Boucher and then takes it back so it can't be used to, to, as a source of weapons, and I'd like to see that continue and expand. Um, now, it's not totally rosy. We've got potential problems. I mean, as far as I understand, Iran's fully implemented it. Um, but we may see a different Iranian government in the future that may be less supportive of the nuclear deal. Even if not, the, the deal itself is of limited duration. So there's a question of what Iran will do it, as if it, it's what it's going to become now is sort of a virtual nuclear state like Germany or Japan. It's, it could, could get nuclear weapons soon if it made such a decision. And so we have to think about how to discourage such a decision. Uh, there's uh, the so-called procurement channel. The, the trick we have is Iran. We want Iran, we, we can't block everything that Iran wants to get that could be potentially sensitive uh, in terms of, uh, because then they will just go through the black market and we'll lose all, trans, you know, we'll lose a lot of visibility of what they're doing, but, but we also have to make sure that we don't actually give them uh, technology that they could be used to make in a nuclear weapon or related. The problem is Russia and the U.S. and China are differing a bit on some of the related issues, particularly the, the missile question, the ballistic missile a question. Um, it, it, now, it, the, itself, this is reflected the fact that the agreement, the, the, the terms of how, how the treat missiles is a bit ambiguous. It's not technically part of the Iran nuclear deal. We decided to put everything aside to get the nuclear deal. Um, but there are other Security Council provisions that, that, that call on Iran not to test what, uh, missiles that could carry a nuclear weapon. And and there's a debate between Russia and U.S. now about if Iran does not comply, which it you know, clearly is not, it, said it, it never said it would. It said it, it considers this inappropriate, this restriction. What do we do? Um, and the U.S. is putting unilateral sanctions on, and the Russian government and the Chinese government are opposing those that imply there some, should be some restrictions on their government's activity, their, their company's activities. So we'll need to sort that out. I I think it can be though sorted out just if we focus on the technical issue rather than the juridical issue. Um, one, another area where I think we could cooperate is the International Atomic Energy Agency itself. It's going to be a challenge just monitoring the Iran. It's such a large country. It's got extensive nuclear activities. It, by its own admission, went out. It had to develop a sophisticated uh, means of procuring uh, goods and so on that were denied to it by the sanctions. And now sanctions relax, but they still have that expertise. Um, and the, the, the agency is going to try out some new detection technologies, environmental detection, and so on. But we're, we're not sure how that's going to work. And they're going to need more money, and we need to train the next generation of monitors and so on. So that's an area where I think we're going to have to work further. And, and, and again, Russia and China can be helpful in the sense that the Iranians, I think, are more comfortable working with their nuclear experts than U.S. experts. Somewhat. I'm not sure entirely they trust anybody, but certainly there. Um, 
in terms of uh, Korea, this is a harder problem. And the Russian position is a is interesting. I mean, the, the U.S. position is is been we're not going to deal with North Korea until they go back and agree to uh, compl- uh, comply with their nuclear commitments, uh, stop cease their uranium program, cease their plutonium program, and uh, eliminate it in a verifiable and controllable manner. Um, and the North Korea says it won't do that, and so we that's where we've been for the past eight years. There's been no real dialogue. There's been pretty much stalemate. We've got an Iranian, uh, a North Korean nuclear or missile test every couple of years, and so we're sort of in this deadlock. And the U.S., the next U.S. team is going to have to rethink what they're going to do. Uh, uh, it's times the U.S. has tried to rely on China to help solve this problem. There are those in the U.S. who think that if the Chinese just really put their foot down, they could force North Korea to to stop their nuclear program. I mean, it would. Be Entail cutting back luxury goods and, and enforcing a lot of uh, prohibitions on the activities of Chinese um, entities that appear to be uh, cooperating with North Korean entities that appear to be linked to the nuclear program. Um, there's much of the exchanges that go on between Iran and North Korea, which are not nuclear, they're more missile. Uh, they pass through China. Um, and the Chinese have always said, well, we, we don't want, and I believe them, they don't want North Korea to have nuclear weapons, they don't want them to test these missiles, but they are concerned, as I say, about the people of North Korea, and they don't want to ruin their relations with this crazy government there. They don't say that, but that's sort of how I read it. Um, they're concerned about uh, the, I mean, I think if you, when a push comes to sub, they would rather have a North Korea under the current regime than risk its collapse and and the follow through, which might be reunification under U.S. and South Korea, or uh, you know massive refugees, nuclear material, whatever, or war or something. So in the end, they rather they'll stick with the current regime and try and reform it. I think their hope is that this government, the Kim dynasty, will follow the same path China did. I mean, it was a very uh, aggressive, a sort of approach to nuclear weapons and under Mao and then it basically mellowed out and, and joined the international system and came in favor of non-proliferation and so on. So I think their hope is they can, over time, North Korea will change. Um, and the U.S. argument is we don't have that time. That, uh, that, that if we wait, I mean, if eventually North Korea will get a com- missile that can launch a nuclear warhead at the United States and, and so on. Now, the Russia position is interesting. I'm not sure I fully where, understand where it is now, so I'd be, I'm open to insights on this. I mean, Russia clearly does not want North Korea to have nuclear weapons, and it doesn't like these missile tests because, I mean, like the Chinese and the USA, this just gives the U.S. an excuse to build up its missile defenses in, in the region um, and leads to high school tensions. Now, Russia, in the, under the past few years at least, has played an interesting role in trying to engage the, the North Korean government. Um, and has been more successful than that than the Chinese, I think, because for reasons I don't fully understand, the, the uh, Kim Jong Un just doesn't like the Chinese government. I don't know, maybe he was mistreated when he was, you know, by then when his child or something, but he thought he was disrespected. Anyway, he just doesn't get along how the Chinese. I mean, you probably know this better since it's your area, but they just doesn't seem to get along. And and he's and one of his ways to manage this, is, I think, is to move closer to Russia. And at least President Putin is. Our as I call it, even go back to 1990, he's always been interested in trying to reach out to North Korea and get that government to change. I think he made a you know, visit there when he was first president and in, I think it was, yeah, like 2000, was it? When he went there and he almost got a missile deal. And then since then, it's been on and off, but he's been um, working with them. And in the last two years, it was really looking like they're making a lot of progress that the, between them, the moscow Pyongyang relationship. Uh, there were a lot of deals announced, exchanges of visitors, and it looked like Kim was going to come to the May Day Parade, and uh, that would have been good, get him out of the shell in Pyongyang, you know, park had gone, maybe they could have talked, and, and but for whatever reason it, he didn't, he sent somebody else, and, and, and since then it's not clear to me the relationship has been going anywhere. Um, what 
I found interesting is some recent uh, Russian government statements. For uh, there was that one in particular about warning keeps national peace and security, and that you know, and the U.S. And the Security Council was obliged to deal with that, and that could affect um, you know North Korean security. I'm curious what was behind that. Um, now, just basically fundamentally, I think there's a, a difference between the three countries on what they're willing to do. And again, I'm not totally sure on Russia's position. The U.S. would prefer regime change. I mean, it's clear the U.S. would rather have a different government in North Korea. And so they're willing to take the risk of instability to do that within reason. The Chinese, as we mentioned, the obverse, they want a buffer state there. Uh, they, they'd rather have, though in the end, they'd rather they choose stability or not Um And I don't think they want reunification under any, any current scenario. Russia, I'm not sure about. I mean, I think Russia could go, could accept reunification under some conditions. There's certainly economic benefits for Russia. A lot of the economic plans would want to link the, you, you know, link the two parts of Korea and, and that as a means to bring Russia closer to East Asian economic uh, dynamics uh, through the railroad, uh, energy, and other conduits through the Korean Peninsula. It would remove a source of instability on Russia's side. It would perhaps, I think Russia might demand uh, limits on uh, or removal of all the U.S. forces from the region and, and so on in return for reunification. But I don't think it's fundamentally opposed to it the way uh, I think the Chinese still are, despite some changes in their views. Uh, beyond that, there's some other issues. I mean, the NPT review conference, as we know, ended in stalemate. It wasn't too alarmed. Only half of them actually are able to reach a consensus. The reason it broke up and had really nothing to do with the Russia-China-U.S. dynamic. It was a fight between the United States and, and, and Egypt over the wording of uh, the WMD free zone for Israel. I mean, the U.S. argument was the terms have to be something that Israel will accept or they won't come to the WMD conference and the Egyptians uh, were more insistent that they, their, Israel had to make a commitment to give up its uh, whatever weapons of mass destruction it has to participate and, that, and that, we got into this fight and that's, that's really what disrupted it. Um, I don't think the conditions are right, right for WMD free Middle East at the moment. I mean, even with the Iran deal uh, and the Syria chemical deal, the whole region's in, a, in so chaos. I, I don't know. It just doesn't seem right for me. South Asia, I don't know as much about, so I'd be interested in what people think on that. The U.S. has, has always been trying to cap or somehow affect the dynamic between India and Pakistan. Just uh, and there's a fear that as they develop low yield nuclear weapons, as they develop, expand their forces, it's just you're it's just waiting for some terrorist incident to trigger a kind of dynamic we don't want to see. Uh, and the dispute is, is it's been a bit under the table, but it's a bit between China and the U.S. over to what extent you're willing to pressure to Pakistan, uh, since the Pac China obviously wouldn't want Pakistan to parity with India. Um, and, and the Russian position is a little less visible to me. Russia's relations with Pakistan have improved recently, and so I'm, I'd be interested in how that could shape itself. Uh, comprehensive test ban treaty. Russia's the good guy here. Russia's ratified the CTBT. China and the U.S. have not. I suspect the Chinese are waiting for the U.S. I don't think, I don't think they're waiting. They really want to test nuclear weapons. But um, the U.S., for domestic reasons and others, is just not going to ratify it anytime soon. I don't think. Um, something I um, think is more optimistically, we're making a lot of progress, I think, on this P5 process, the permanent five members of the Security Council have been meeting together, um, talk. I mean, Russia and the U.S. have long had these kind of dialogues about proliferation dynamics and definitions of terms and so on. And I, now I think it's engaging the Chinese more. They took charge of writing the agreed terminology recently. That's an interesting 
pressing error, I think, for further development. I mean, as you know, the other countries criticize the P5 for not making fast enough reductions in, in, in nuclear weapons. Um, and so engaging in this dialogue is a useful means to consider how to address those concerns. Um, there's a, a, a bit of tension over this U.S. initiative about um, verification. How do you, you, the U.S. is interested in trying to make clear to countries that don't have nuclear weapons how difficult it would be to verify a nuclear-free world. Um, and so we've been trying to uh, explain to them just some of the challenges. And Russia and China have objected a bit because it, it, there's some concern we're violating the uh, NPT provision about sharing nuclear knowledge with non-nuclear states. And so we'll have to figure out what we're going to do with that. Um, the uh, there's some tools I think we might consider further development. I'm just going to end here because I think we're running out of time. The three I would highlight would be um, the, uh, the, the making a safer next generation nuclear reactors, more safe, secure, self-contained units. The uh, Global Initiative Against Nuclear Terrorism in which we work on um, a whole range of areas in my workshops on you know, forensics, on state and local authorities, how to respond to nuclear incidents, on a variety of ways. It's been a good dialogue. And then this proliferation security initiative, which is uh, something Russia is involved in, but China is not, I think because of North Korea, about uh, limiting the um, transit, uh, particularly through uh, the sea, of uh, missiles and uh, you know, weapons of mass destruction and their means of delivery, so missiles and nuclear technology. That's, that's something we'll, we might see further development. But I think at this point I'll just end it. Um, I just threw out some ideas or other challenges and opportunities, but I, I think we can go to a good dialogue. Roger, thank you so much for that very dynamic presentation. You've touched upon so many issues, that, and it kind of justifies picking almost any topic we want. So thank you for making, awesome. us, making us feel free about that. Um, we're now open for questions and comments. Um, while you are thinking, I may start with one, with a couple of uh, ones that I've come up with while you were uh, speaking, and about, we'll start with North Korea, perhaps. Um, the question is very simple. Um, well, when the last resolution on North Korea was uh, adopted a couple of weeks ago, I think, um, there was a lot of talk that China was the star of that process, and that it's China that is the that holds all the keys to reducing, at least reducing, the North Korean nuclear threat. Um, and a lot of people in Russia, a lot of experts in Russia, felt that you know that kind of means a relative decline for Russia's role in the process, in the whole Korean denuclearization process. Would you say that Russia is still indispensable to the dialogue? And how does Russia maintain this indispensability? Now, it's interesting you have that view. I, that was the U.S. view a, a few years ago, that China was the key. Uh, particularly under the Bush administration, um, there was a lot of effort to get the Chinese. And, and at times, the Chinese seemed to think that was true, so they initiated the six-party talks. Um, but the Chinese have recently downplayed that connection in in, 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 a, in in correlation with their declining relationship with North Korea. I think they've become a little more uh, reluctant to get into a fight with Pyongyang on this issue than maybe previously or to pressure them. And they're more uh, insistent that about their limits of their influence in, 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 in Pyongyang and that in North Korea can't really... I mean, China really doesn't have the kind of influence in North Korea that the U.S thinks it has. 
Um, and then um, less visibly, but you can you can see it in some Chinese discourse. There's a lot of suspicion that the U.S. is using this the Korean issue uh, to basically support, sustain, and support and, and draw South Korea into its rebalancing slash containing China policy. Um, I think President Park tried to avert that. You know, she went to China. She knows Chinese. She and, and so she. I, but I don't think she succeeded. I think it. Whereas at times the Chinese look like they were willing to make a switch and consider that it would be better for China to have a unified Korea that looked like South Korea rather than what they have now. I think they backed away from that. Um, and I think that unfortunately that means the South Korean relationship is, is, is not as good with China as it was at one point. And now it does look like it's you know China and the U.S. Uh, sorry, Korea, South Korea and the U.S. against North Korea with China reluctantly siding with, with North Korea. Um, now China, it's true, they've, for the, they've agreed to sanctions which they've never agreed to before. But the problem that it always has been has been enforcement. That, and this isn't true, this isn't just in the nuclear area. This is true with everything in, in China, that the central government would make an agreement on climate change or pollution or, or, or not, you know, not violating copyright. But then at the provincial level, at the, at the world of influential businesses, entities, they somehow seem to be able to just go ahead. Um, I think under the stronger Chinese leadership, you're going to see people in Washington have less, be less willing to give China the benefit of the doubt. Whereas in the past, it actually did look like the you know the Chinese China and the U.S. governments reached an agreement, and then these were just being ignored by local officials in line with local businesses that who wanted to maximize employment didn't particularly care that much about violating U.S. copyright laws or shipping sensitive items to uh, North Korea. I think now the feeling is you have a stronger government in Beijing that can enforce these agreements if it wants to. In terms of Russia, um, I, I've not actually seen that. As I said, I, the only thing, I, the trend I've seen is China is Russia's relations with, China, with uh, North Korea improving rapidly in the last few years, uh, at least in terms of quantity, in terms of business and so on. Really, there's still, I mean, there's no real strong animosity towards uh, South Korea and Russia or vice versa. I mean, I think the South Koreans may have had, agreed to some Ukraine-related sanctions, but it was like the Japanese. They didn't really want to, but the U.S. sort of forced them to because of the Treasury. Um, and so I think that there are many in South Korea who still think that that. Moscow and Beijing are the key to getting some kind of arrangement. So I've not actually seen anyone think that Russia's influence in in, in, in South Korea has or North Korea has declined it or its role has declined. Um, so I don't. I, I've not. I've actually seen that. Actually, I don't think that's the U.S. At least U.S. view. I may be here. It's good to hear. Yeah. So uh, the floor is open. Uh, please don't forget to identify yourselves. Please. Vladimir Sajan from the Institute of Oriental Studies. I'm a specialist on Iran. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, very interesting presentation. And you uh, reminded, uh, you said, about the uh, Iranian nuclear program, yes? And uh, my question may be, may be very simple or may be very stupid. Uh, but what do you th think, Russia, the U.S., and uh, China, and other uh, members uh, of uh, the group 5 plus 1, uh, have destroyed uh, the Iranian possibility to build a nuclear bomb, or uh, maybe in 10 or uh, 15 years, Iranians return to an idea, to the idea to build this uh, nuclear weapon, and if uh, it is so, it will be so. In this uh, 10, 20, uh, 10, uh, 15 years, if they uh, have a possibility to do so. Thank you. Right. Um, 
I mean, the, the critical question here is, I don't know the answer. You, you may, because you, you're an Iranian expert, but uh, yeah, it, they, it, if they want to get a nuclear weapon, I, I mean, I know this is a dis, uh, under issue in debate in Iran, and we know from the past there were at least some Iranians who thought that it would be good for Iran to have a nuclear weapon, but I just don't know. I mean, you can argue it either way. Um, the way the deal is structured is you are correct. It, 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 it rolls back Iran's capacity to develop a nuclear bomb from months to perhaps a year because they have less material. And if they follow the agreement, then they won't have that capacity for um, perhaps 15 years if, they, if you go to the full length. Um, but afterwards, there's not... Uh, a re- there's no way, you know, there's no legal way yet to, to, to prohibit them from uh, from basically revisiting the questions that are in the deal, which is how much enrichment can they have? Are they forever denied the possibility of being able to, to you know, you make a plutonium reactor to enrich uranium to 20%, all those things. Um, and so the fissile material is hard. The, 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 then there are other parts. There's the missile part and there's the warhead part, which is a bit more uncertain, but you're right. It, the deal itself is—it's even if it's fully implemented, it is not enough. We'll need to have something that goes beyond that. And I think our ex- experts are now debating. The Iranians have said that they would consider extending these prohibitions, but they have to apply to everybody. They can't just apply to Iran. So we would have to have um, more countries accept it, and and. I Perhaps you can get the UAE and Saudi Arabia to do it. Turkey would be harder. But there's one country that I know is going to be difficult to get, and I don't know how to, that that's a hard one. And I don't know how you're going to solve that. Um, so you're right, our work is not done. We There's no evidence Iran is pursuing nuclear weapons right now, but you know who knows who's going to be in charge of Iran 10 years from now, and and, and the capacity is there. They, they have it. I mean, they, they, they know how to enrich uranium. I mean, it's a 60-year-old technology. I mean, a lot. it's not hard to make a nuclear weapon. Or people know how to do it. It's just a question of if they can get enough uranium and get the delivery system and, and the intent. That's the key thing. We So far, so far, it's been really good that if, if beyond Korea and beyond Iran, there's no country out there, unlike, you know, 10, 20 years ago when we worried a lot about people like Argentina or Brazil or whatever, there's no country out there now that, that is actively or at least considering getting a nuclear weapon. But if so, if we can deal with Iran and Korea, I think we're then the proliferation system is not in crisis. But if if those two are not solved, then I worry South Korea, um, Turkey, Saudi Arabia. I just worry that it's going to be hard, and then and then we don't know. And as I think we all understand, the more countries have more nuclear weapons, the more nuclear weapons there are, the more likely one will be used, and, and we just don't know what happens when that occurs. Yes, please. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Weiss, thank you for your lecture. It was uh, really substantial and informative. Uh, I'm um, Nadia Meslinkova. I'm from um, Moscow um, um, State University of International Relations. I'm a fourth year student and I study India and Pakistan specifically. And uh, that's why I would like to uh, to ask you a question. Um, in 2015, um, an interesting report was uh, published by uh, Toby Dalton and Michael Crippen uh, in their uh, work uh, in Normal Nuclear Pakistan. Um, and uh, in this report, uh, they um, touch upon the issue of Pakistani nuclear ar- uh, arsenal. And um, in this 
this report, they assert that uh, it will increase to uh, 200 uh, nuclear warheads uh, uh, to, uh, on, uh, I'm sorry, in two, uh, 2025, and Pakistan may become the third nuclear power in the world. And do you think it's a plausible assumption? Uh, or it was uh, an Indian lobby in the United States uh, who organized this campaign against Pakistan? Thank you. I'm sure the Pakistanis say the latter, but, but yes. No, I, I mean, that sounds reasonable. I mean, that's not a large increase from what they have now. I mean, I, 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 mean, I'm, I, mean, I think they're getting to 100, maybe. Uh, I don't know the exact figure. Um, I mean, the, the problem, of course, we have is that Pakistan wants to match India and compensate for its, you know, Indian conventional superiority. The Indians want to deal with China and figure out how do they, they match the China. And so they're pacing themselves differently. And so if China and India goes to try and deal with China, which is building up its forces because to deal with the US, right? And then and then the Indians try and match China and then the Pakistan try and match India. It's just it's this dynamic that it's kinda of hard to break because they're they're looking in different directions. Um, so I find there are new opportunities, particularly I think in the Russia Pakistan. Pakistani relationship. When I was here 10 years ago, 15 years ago, the Russians would speak about Pakistan the same way the Americans would speak about Iran. You know, these crazy guys that, they, that, that you know, you have to be careful, the terror, the Islamic extremists are going to get a hold of a bomb and they're going to, you know, they're going to send it off to Chechnya or something. I mean, it, was, it was the same way we would speak about the Iranians. They would, and that's changed. I mean, uh, the, uh, Russia's relationship with Afghanistan, Pakistan, Pakistan have gotten better, um, and yet Russia and Indian relationship remains good. So I think Russia is in a really good position to try and um, help manage that dynamic, particularly since it all, Russia also has good relations with China. Um, I mean, the, the U.S. is in a much more difficult position in some respects. Um, the Pakistanis hate Americans. I mean, for a reason we don't need to get into. There was a poll. I don't know what, who they want this year, but during the last presidential election, they polled all the countries. Every country in the world wanted Obama except for one, and that was the Pakistanis. They wanted anybody than, than Obama. And so the U.S. influence in Pakistan is, 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 is it's limited, particularly on the nuclear clear issue. Um, so but we'll have to, you know we'll have to see. There's it, there's not an active it's the, the US at least has always prioritized other things in its relationship with Pakistan and same with India. Um, and I, I, you know, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. So I, I think that that does sound plausible unless something happens to stop it. Um, but I, I'm not sure they'd be third. I'll bet, I, I would think the Indians will make sure that they, they stay third, or at least a little ahead of, of, of Pakistan um, in, in looking ahead. Uh, thank you, but um, uh, I would like to know, uh, but do, do you think that it's, um, it's really plausible because uh, actually uh, Pakistan, uh, to my mind, doesn't have enough opportunity to do that, economic opportunity, because uh, as we all know, uh, pa uh, Pakistani uh, energy uh, sector of economy uh, uh, is really dependent uh, on Chinese uh, government. Uh, I think maybe be around 85% uh, uh, is fun, uh, funded by China, and that's why um, it's uh, really interesting. Uh, how can they do that? Uh, I'm just really mm. need to know. Thanks. Right. I mean, there's a there has to be uh, just a, the China relationship is interesting in that the U.S. has normally been the largest aid giver to Pakistan. The Chinese don't give aid; they have like trade or investment, but they have a couple exceptions of which the nuclear is one and it, to all appearances it looks like the Chinese gave Pakistan the blueprints to make a nuclear weapon you know when they were worried about India a while ago they don't do that kind of stuff anymore but it does look like that's what they did in the, in the 70s um, and I don't you know the, the China India relationships changing a bit it, I mean if they get into the Shos, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization it will, China will have had to make a major decision to do that, allow that um, I, 
I think it's plausible. I don't think it's that expensive. I mean, it, 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 they, they, to, to, to make the if they already have a nuclear command, they already know how to make nuclear weapons. They have some nuclear weapons. Um, to make more. I don't know if it's really... I don't think it's that expensive. They would need maybe another enrichment facility. Um, it's normally not a money thing that keeps countries from getting nuclear weapons. It's normally something else. Um, in some ways, it's cheaper just having nuclear weapons than a large conventional force. I mean, you're right, their economy is not in good shape. Um, and they have both those countries, India and Pakistan, have large energy shortages that can be solved, uh, I think, you know, through uh, renewable energy or trading with Central Asia or a bunch of things. Um, but the nuclear is a bit special. I think they can get that many weapons. Um, I don't know, you know, if, if, if they will want to. It depends a bit on the... Uh, I, 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 I think that the military makes that decision in Pakistan. You know this better than I do probably, but my impression is the military still decides certain issues, relations with the Taliban, um, nuclear weapons. I mean, there are a couple of areas with them, despite the civilian government, that, at least in Pakistan, the, the military makes those decisions, and they seem to consider it an existential issue that they need the nuclear weapons to be to 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 prevent India from you know destroying Pakistan. I think that's the the, me, the message I get from talking with them. Um, if they think that, then they will, as they said, they'll eat grass if they need to to make nuclear weapons. So I don't think that's the problem. Hello. Uh, thank you very much, Professor White. I'm my friend Isas from Angimor University. Um, I was there this morning, by the way. So there was a conference on the whole thing, Boini, uh, Churchill, and all that. So, yes. uh, my question goes uh, that more <coughs> uh, about a bit of hypocrisy of the U.S. side on the nuclear department because during the Cold War we understood there were two superpowers both with nuclear weapons and that was fine for the world I mean we were afraid after especially the missile the Cuban missile crisis in the 60s but then this selective club which had only two members started having new members so we cannot say that they are the nuclear powers today like China or, or India or Pakistan or Russia because there are nuclear weapons also in the Netherlands and in the UK and in France and etc. And I ask myself in the Iranian case which was something I, I deeply followed why was America especially the US <clears throat> because I myself I am I'm Latin American I don't like calling Americans to all of us um, so why was the U.S. so against Iran having nuclear weapons, but why did nothing was said from another country in the Middle East, like Israel, to acquire nuclear weapons? Or what would happen if, for instance, South Korea would like to have nuclear weapons, and then we will have most of Asia with nuclear weapons, having China, having Russia, having North Korea, South Korea, and eventually why not Japan or Taiwan, for instance. So I think this hypocrisy is leading to more countries, more nuclear weapons, and less stability. What's your take on that? Thank you very much. Um, I think you sort of answered, the, given the answer I was going to give already embedded in your question, because um, you are, to some extent, correct. It's kind of weird for an American to get up there and say, you, you know, we're, we're bad, you shouldn't have nuclear weapons, and so on, when we have nuclear I mean, this is a problem. There's, there's no easy answer to this one here. Uh, and this is, uh, particularly in Latin America, it's not an issue anymore, but it was when the U.S. was pressing Argentina and Brazil uh, and Chile about their nuclear programs and, and you know and, and there was uh, I mean there were proprietary information and the Brazilians were trying to you know protect some of their enrichment technology and the US was pressuring them to open it up and, and so on so it's, it's, it's a problem I mean you, you mentioned the Israel problem that one's a problem you mentioned the fact that I mean it's there's a problem 
this is not alone in the nuclear field. I mean, it's the whole issue of the Security Council. Why are there five permanent members of the Security Council and always and not others? I mean, there's not anyone from Latin America that I'm aware of in that five. Um, um, and so, okay, now, but the answer I would give was what you followed up with. Uh, the, if you have what you have now, right? You have five countries that, that have legitimate, if I'd be a temporary uh, provision to have nuclear weapons pending disarmament, and you can argue about how rapidly they're disarming, whether they're going fast enough. And clearly, the episode's going, it's going in the wrong direction now. I mean, the Chinese are increasing and so on. Um, and then there are a couple other states, India, Pakistan, um, North Korea, and you mentioned another, that have uh, or thought to have nuclear weapons, which are, would, are not legal. And then there are a bunch of others. But the, the way you, what you said, and you were right, it would be a disaster if all these other countries are getting nuclear weapons. And that's always been the U.S. argument that, okay, it's not just what we have now, but it's better and uh, than the alternative, which is to have a lot of countries have nuclear weapons. So it's better that fewer rather than more. Um, and the U.S. And uh, the current holders, now if not always, are responsible stakeholders. And this argument is now made about India too, that they become more cognizant. But you're right, it's really hard. It, it, it's hard. I mean, you can press, it, there's no, you can't, I can't argue from uh, from a international justice that what we have now is, 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 is not, is not, Incorrect, or that I were being hypocritical and saying some countries got nuclear weapons and others can't. I, I, you're right. So we have to argue on pragmatic grounds. So it's just better to have fewer than more. And then I, I have a very short yes/no question for you. Do you think in our lifespan, let's say in the following 50 years, we could live in a world without nuclear weapons? I, I say no, but I mean, but that's just um, I don't have much left to live. You're younger, so maybe you can say. Maybe you can say yes, but I'm, yeah, it's, it's it's hard. I mean, the Obama administration, on the one hand, said, "Yeah, we want a world without nuclear weapons," but then if you read what they said, the, the conditions you have to do that. There can't be any conflict between states. There has to be total transparency. Uh, there has to be um, inter, you know strong international verification. I mean, basically, there is no way you can get the conditions to get to zero. Um, so. That's just my own view. You know, you can be optimistic, right? <laughs> Your answer to the first question reminds me of an expression that there's nothing worse than being old except older for the alternative. <laughs> Please. Mr. West, uh, about all, please. Uh, well, my name is Kirill Kirenko, Moscow State Law University, uh, Deputy Director of Contemporary Law Institution and Nuclear Law Expert. Yeah, so, about all, please let me express my thanks to the organization, to the Council, for having Mr. West here, because it's a great honor for us to, to have you here and to have an opportunity to ask you several questions. So, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, during your speech, your, your, your lecture, you mentioned um, several times the, the MPT, this treaty. And so would you say that there is no any future for MPT? Or would you say that that is going to be some future for, um, uh, for having something new, maybe, instead of MPT? Or how could we deal with it right now? Thank you. All right. Um, just to remind people, what we have now is we have this treaty against the prohibition of nuclear weapons, um, and it's a complicated treaty. There are many who describe it as this three-part deal. Uh, there are some five countries are allowed to have nuclear weapons for a while, as long as they make progress to removing them. Other countries agree not to get nuclear weapons. Um, uh, and the, the current five don't agree not to help them. And and yet, and then the third is that we will incur, help other all countries develop peaceful nuclear energy. Um, and there are contradictions between this, because if you can have a peaceful nuclear energy program, particularly if you can have the right to enrich uranium, then you can make a nuclear weapon pretty easily. Um, and so people argue about to what extent you allow that sharing and, and, and so on. Um, 
there, this is different because there is an alternative from what we have in the, the question of the chemical weapons and biological weapons. There we have conventions that say, you know, based on your question, nobody can have chemical weapons. Nobody can have biological weapons. You can't have them. You can't make them. You can't, certainly can't use them. You can't help others to get them. You have to take steps to prevent non-state actors or criminals from getting them. And there are those who say, that's what we need for nuclear weapons. We need a nuclear weapons convention that says no country can have nuclear weapons, no country can have them, we'll destroy them all. And so that's the alternative. Now, I've said I don't think you can get there under present terms, at least in my lifetime. The NBT, I, you know, it's it's so far okay holding for the most part. There have been some problems, you know, like North Korea, uh, India, Pakistan, and one other country. Um, but there haven't been the 50 or whatever countries. That, there are many countries that could get nuclear weapons, but they have chosen not to. Um, perhaps because they, you know, feel they don't need them, and the NPT may be playing part of that. Because it'll, you know, the U.S., for example, argues that having nuclear weapons allows it to protect countries, so they don't need to get their own nuclear weapons. So, so I'm not. I mean, that's why I wasn't too upset about the deadlock with the NPT um, review conference last year, because I still think that most countries still think that it's it's just not worth it. I mean, Japan was an example of what can happen to you if you have a major nuclear accident, right? I mean, we almost lost Japan, according to some experts, if, if, because of what was happening there. Uh, it would have just, you know, elimination of the civilization because if they had if the if nuclear accident. Right. So a lot of countries are lucky even to get nuclear energy. But this could change depending on what happens to Iran. The spreading of technology is not helpful in some ways, too. Um, it's easier now to make enrich uranium. There are now lasers that can do this, right? You don't even need it. And you can't, how would you find them? Because you can't, like, big enrichment facilities, you could do this in a, you know, very small, hard to detect. Um, and there are other problems. And so I, but still, the empty seems to me the best. But but there are a lot of people who think that we should go for nuclear weapons invention. The U.S. has been trying to argue against that by saying we can't. That's what that verification argument I was getting into uh, earlier. Я воспользуюсь возможностью задать вопрос на русском языке. Зовут меня Анна Кучма, uh, Russia Beyond the Headlines. Uh, у меня такой больше по новостной повестке дня вопрос. Uh, в конце марта, начале апреля в Вашингтоне пройдет четвертый саммит по ядерной безопасности, ну и Россия, в общем-то, отказалась туда ехать. Uh, причем обоснование давал МИД, и в качестве объяснения они приводили такое суждение, что якобы в этот раз страны-организаторы собираются навязывать МАГАТЭ некие свои установки, которые должны будут регулировать эту сферу. В общем-то, какое, какое мнение придерживается экспертное сообщество, то есть трактовка российской позиции и что это означает? Будем ли мы как-то сотрудничать по этой программе дальше или мы все свои обязательства уже выполнили? Спасибо. One of the, uh, I think, a good development of the Obama administration was they set up these nuclear security summits um, in which, because uh, President Obama says this is the most important thing in the world, we've got to keep nuclear weapon or nuclear materials out of the hands of terrorists. And so we're going to hold a summit in Washington. He started that, and I think the first one was in 2010. Um, and Medvedev came, because I remember they talked about the Kyrgyz crisis on the sidelines, uh, and a bunch of other leaders leaders came and they worked out ways to strengthen those barriers. The next summit was supposed to be in Moscow, but I'm not, for reasons weren't clear to me, Russia decided it couldn't do it and so South Korea hosted it. And then the 2014 was in the Netherlands and now we're going to have the last one in Washington in a couple weeks. Um, 
Russia either let it be known or the U.S. leaked or something. Somehow it came, became clear last year that Russia was not going to come to the last conference. Um, and you're right, Russia gave us, the, the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs gave a series of reasons why. Um, and some of them were, as you said, that it felt that the previous summit holders were arrogant themselves too much decision, so Russia wasn't able to play the role it wanted, uh, that we, they didn't need another summit, that the first three had done enough and they didn't see the point of a fourth, that this was uh, irrigating, that the summit process was impinging on what should be the, the role of the International Atomic Energy Agency and was trying to tell the International Atomic Energy what to do in this and other areas. And there were a couple others that I think came out. Um, and I, we were alarmed. Um, but since then, I mean, Russia has said that and, and, it's, and it's not participating in the summit. But it didn't do what I feared Russia could have done, which was tell the Chinese, tell the Kazakhs, tell them don't go. Uh, as I talked to American diplomats. I was worried about this because uh, Chinese didn't want to come to like the one in Seoul and we really had to press them to come. But they tell me the Russians have not told other countries not to come. They've not put pressure on anybody else. Uh, uh, and so, you know, like they said, the Kazakhs are going to involve the Chinese. And um, it looks like Russia will have some observer capacity or some way of being, you know, you know understanding what's happening. So I'm not. It hasn't. Prov- it hasn't been a problem yet. Now going ahead, we all have to think about what's going to replace the summits Um, because they're going to end with Obama and I don't know what the next administrations will do. I mean, they're going to do something different. Um, And clearly the IEA has a role to play in this area. It's it's missing some authorities um, but it's probably central and then we 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 got to figure out how to involve industry a bit because they're the ones that make the the reactors and and we have to involve you know like medical facilities and the scientists I mean so on so it's clearly something we all have to deal with um, and Russia said it's it's eager to work on that so I don't it didn't turn out to be the problem I thought it would be uh, when the boycott came out so as I said it's been a non-crisis which is good right because of all the other problems we have in our relationship, we were afraid that this was... In, in, but so far, Russia and has carved out Iran, North Korea, not, not except for the, the, the non-Luger programs in Russia. You know, the U.S. used to like, give money to groups here to help Russia eliminate its nuclear... Um, the Soviet, excess Soviet nuclear facilities and tighten security to others. Um, and it was a, a bit of a weird relationship. And an arms control agreement, you know, everybody's equal, we exchange monitoring. In this one, it was the U.S. would give the money and get the monitoring. In Russia, it was, Russia felt, which is true, it wasn't really a very fair, you know, sort of weird relationship. And now Russia says, you know, they're going to fund this themselves and they don't want Americans, you know, sort of spying on their own nuclear activity. So, but in terms of cooperating on third countries, that's still going well. So we worked together to get some enrichment, uh, maybe I think it was out of Uzbekistan recently. Um, and, and so, so, so far, I've been surprised that we've that we've protected this area well. Now, so that's where I'm at. And I think it, it's been a non-crisis. So, you know, leave it at that. Thank you. I, I will uh, use my power as a moderator to ask kind of questions. Will be a twofold question and a good transition from what you just said. Um, the first one is about uh, President Obama saying that this is the, the most important thing in the world. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm um, where exactly uh, it was, but in some of his recent interviews, he said, well, like, okay, the Islamic State is not an existential threat to humanity, while climate change is. So, probably he has some kind of, uh, you know, rating, at least in his mind, of what are the existential threats. And so, how would you assess the existentiality of the threat of a non nuclear conflict in the world, right. uh, particularly that between U.S. and Russia. And uh, this will be the second part of my question. Uh, this Monday, our, uh, the Russian Council President Igor Ivanov, he published an article in Russian. It will be out, I think, 
uh, well, in the near in the future, uh, probably in the end of the week, about U.S.-Russia relations. And he argues that uh, contemporary U.S.-Russia relations are in uh, such a bad state that um, actually the con- the danger of an all-out nuclear conflict is more than it used to be in the Soviet times, in the times of the Cold War, because the he calls it the density of political contacts and technical contacts is slower than it used to be. So how would you assess this density of contacts that would serve, that they're supposed to serve as a safe safety net for uh, a possible nuclear conflict between the US and Russia, and adding China to this equation? In this triangle, how thick is this network of our security contacts, so to say? Right. There are a couple of questions embedded in that. Yeah. Just, I'm going to take them apart. They're all good. Uh, just, I'm going to uh, take them apart because I think the answer might differ a little. Um, the I, I do not consider the possibility of a, an overt nuclear war between Russia, China, the U.S., or anyone else high. I consider it very low because we know it could end. It, you know <laughs> how it could end bad for both. Um, and so that's uh, just as an aside. That's we haven't seen these kind of great power wars that we used to, you know, there'd be like a rising country and a falling country, so Germany and Japan would go to war with others. You haven't seen that now, like China has been a rising power, but it's not going around, you know, going to war with the U.S. to seize control over Taiwan or something, and I think the nuclear weapons are are part of that reason. That's what's different in history. Um, And so I still consider, for my own view, which is why I like working in this field, I don't think that the tensions between Russia and the U.S. Or China are is worth it, or they're just not strong enough to to do that. We're not directly in contacting territory. We're not ideological adversaries the way you know we're in the Cold War, um, and 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 a bunch of other reasons. So I, I don't consider it a, a like now. They, even off, and, and, and Sam Nunn and a couple others, uh, people have been good about um, pointing out there's a, there's, of course, a, there's another path to a nuclear war, which is through miscalculation accident, and that feeds into your question about the contacts. Um, and so the, the scenario here is there's, there's, it could just be some kind of m- misinterpretation, cal- miscalculation, you know, Turkey shoots down a Russia plane. Russia attacks the air base at China, shot the plane out of the air missile, and then the U.S. retaliates, and you get some kind of escalation spiral. Or there's just misunderstanding. You know, Russia does a snap exercise with its nuclear forces, and the U.S. or some, you know, some country reads this as preparations for a nuclear attack, and so we put our forces now nuclear alert, and the Russians wonder why we're we doing this. They put theirs, and you, you know, you can. So, so far, that's that's still. I'm Unlikely, but the, but it's it's not as unlikely as and you know, I'd like it to be, or it was a few years ago. It's, it's more you can trace out more possibilities. Um, and it, now the contacts are a problem um, because of the you know, Ukraine and other issues. The NATO is, is you know stop lock contacts with Russia, um, and they. I'm not sure that all of that was wise. And Russia has cut back a lot on the nuclear, you know, helping Russia deal with its nuclear. We talked about that in Luger. And I'm not sure all that was wise either. I'm not sure how, it, it's, 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 it's not helpful. I'm not sure how serious it is, but I, I would prefer if it didn't occur. Um, but your council as and those the think tanks help out a lot. I mean that's why so you know letting me speak here and I and and, and and having you know even off come and speak at Carnegie in the US and I mean all that's very good. Um, but we're not as influential as the, the policy makers. Um, and China it's a real problem. It's it's they cut back a lot they on our contacts. I don't know what it is with Russia China, I assume it's okay, but at least with the China US dialogue, I, I 
I was invited, for example, a few years ago to go to Shenyang and talk with the local Chinese about the Korea problem, and you know, which is right next door. And and you could see the Chinese among themselves arguing. Well, and some of the people say, you know, we got to stand by North Korea. It was, you know, this it's it's they, we, we we have a common concern. The others, people, young ones, were saying, this we got to get rid of this. These guys are crazy. You know, this this is this is these these guys, we've gotta, This is something we have to change our policy on. And uh, since she came to power, you, you don't get that kind of dialogue. And so they canceled that. that I didn't get to go back to Shenyang because they canceled the conference. Um, they, the, the China has changed a lot. They're less open in terms of the dialogue. Russia, I have not seen that yet. Um, and I think that the Minister of Defense here is helpful. They've set up this kind of Munich Security Conference. Uh, the next one will be in next month in which they, they you know, let Western experts and, and Iranians. And the only time I ever get to Iranians or South or North Koreans, by the way, are in Moscow or Beijing. So this is useful to me because it gets it allows me to engage with them. But so far, Russia has been fairly open, but the Chinese have been cutting back. Um, but React, you know, React's very important in that role because you, the Rethinking Russia, the Valdai Group, uh, Carnegie Moscow, there, there's some. Um, uh, the one I was working with, Mike Garson, unfortunately, he's running into that foreign agent yeah. rule. Um, and I know Pierre, for a while, was running into that too. So it's, it's not totally ideal. And there, there's equivalent restrictions in the U.S. now about accepting um, you know, funding through, from Russian or Chinese or other foreign sources. So it's getting a little harder. But the, the problem is more the official dialogue. We just have a lot less talking at the official level. Even if it's pure cut back there. Yes, I know. I know, I know. And it was stupid, too, because the peers are very strongly patriotic Russians. The same with the guys of Russia. They were the toughest guys arguing with them. They were very nationalist. I don't quite know why they ran afoul. So I just, I think the people who put in that law didn't fully understand uh, you know, the Russian think tanks. So even if they took American money, it was be, they wouldn't they would, wouldn't tell us what, what the American government wants them to say. They would tell us what, what, what they were supposed to do, which is what Russia's concerns were. So then we could figure out how to match Russia and U.S. concerns, but we can talk about that some other time. No question. To... We had Senator Nam speaking here, here two weeks ago. Yes, I know. He, yeah, he, and, and uh, was he even up there? I think yeah. Botov was there, yeah. and Hangler. I mean, it was a great. Yeah, I, I, I actually saw that on your your website. So because uh, you're on YouTube, which is also. <laughs> My name is Anna Protenko. I'm working at the Institute of Latin America, Russian Academy of Science, and um, thanking my colleague who brought the topic of the Latin America. I would like to get back in our conversation to this uh, region, huge region. And uh, Professor, you already also mentioned that in Latin America there were several nuclear programs, like in Chile and Brazil and uh, Argentina. But also the region, it's a very big and good example of uh, the countries who do reject to have nuclear nuclear power, because, nuclear weapons, I'm sorry, uh, we all know the Treaty of Tlatelolco. And, uh, but in a changing and in stable wor uh, world, uh, what's your opinion about the future of that treaty? Will it stand? Will it last? Uh, and uh, will the region be still free from nuclear weapons? Thank you very much. I'm just uh, preface, Bubba, I'm not, I don't know much about Latin America, I haven't said yet. However, what is always puzzling from a social science point of view is how peaceful that is. You know, all the regions of the world, world they're all, you know, they're, 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 I mean, there's some internal conflicts in Latin America. But they don't go to war with each other the way they do almost everywhere else. So it's very surprisingly, and I'm not sure why, very peaceful country in terms of their interstate relations. And I don't see any of them having an active nuclear weapons program. And I think now that they're all democracies, they, they wouldn't be able to do it. I mean, it was easier when you had a military government. They could do it secret with funding. And, but now, you know, they're all peaceful democracies. They're, it's, it's a great example. Uh, and so if we could figure out, and I don't know, I can't, but if you could figure out why that region works so well in terms of peace, non-proliferation, and spread it, uh, that would be a great thing to everybody. If you've, I don't know if you're working on that topic, but it's just amazing to me how uh, that the whole region, how well it works. Wait, so, wait, yes, please. I'm sorry, just to, to widen a little bit. Um, yeah, the, one of the bases why they don't have it, it's the poverty problem, so they don't just, they cannot afford it. That's why it was the decision from the beginning of the Tlatelolka, uh, uh, Tlatelolka uh, treaty, but um, 
if we still um, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about if we see the nuclear weapons like the attribute of the great power for example Brazil is pretending to be a great power, original great power right now there are uh, not battle but like d discussion between Brazil and Mexico who is the original leader in that sense would you consider it a possibility that Brazil in the nearest future will have uh, nuclear power uh, nuclear weapons or they, don't, they will not I do not, I just don't, I've not seen any indication. I remember Brazil took a very strong stand on nuclear uh, issues, but it was, it was basically to try and get an Iran deal and they actually went out and made a deal to deal with the Iran nuclear program and then the U.S. repudiated it. And so um, Turkey got really angry at the U.S. I assume Brazil's were too, but they were less they were less vocal about it. But the Turks are furious because it was that Turkey. You know, I just do not see it. I don't see any evidence of anybody in Latin America who wants nuclear weapons or even thinks that to be a great power, you need to have nuclear weapons. I just don't see that, um, and so that's why I'd be interested to see how why they, that that works there. Very small comment from yeah, a very small comment. Sorry, and in regards to what my colleague said, uh, there is a very a potential problem in the Atlantic Ocean Treaty, as uh, France never signed it, and France has a French Guiana in just in the northern coast of Brazil, and there is the Caribou space mission. And in the Caribou space mission, it's suppo uh, supposed by Venezuelan authorities that there are nuclear weapons. So we could have nuclear weapons in Latin America. And our comment, which was maybe um, on what you just said, Professor, is that uh, the both nuclear plants, at least the Argentinian and Brazilian one, were not done by military dictatorships, were done by democratic governments. For instance, the Argentinian one was done in the 40s by President Perón in his second uh, regime uh, using a German or previous Nazi scientist. Thank you. Thank you. So we have one question there and then a bit there. Should we take two and then... Uh, as you wish, I'm, I'm uh, Jakob Vashner. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Dr. Vashner from the Institute for USA and Canadian Studies. Uh, I'd like to mention Israel one more time uh, because in my view it's very important to, to notice that uh, the one nuclear deal showed us that uh, American Israel relations are uh, um, overcoming through very difficult process and uh, we couldn't have imagined it 10 years ago we couldn't have imagined that uh, despite some objections and opposition from uh, Israel government from IPEC and some other local groups and from Republicans uh, administration White House uh, may be able to um, to come so far in uh, making peace with such country like Iran and uh, organize such a deal and uh, in your opinion is it, it is just a single episode in American history or we uh, witnessing uh, kind of start for a new development for uh, new trends in American policy especially when if uh, Hillary Clinton becomes president and the uh, last results uh, show us that uh, it, it becomes more and more possible so do you think uh, America can in the future, uh, maybe in 10 years or in 8 years, join Russia in calling for a nuclear free zone in the Middle East uh, regarding to Israel? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's take the, qu the second question as well. Uh, my name is Alexander Pivorenko. I'm from the Institute for Slavonic Studies of the Russian Academy of Sciences. And in my question, I want to raise maybe uh, an, another aspect of the nuclear problem. Because what we discussed here is, I think, the, the traditional use of the nuclear arms. It's like, you know, like uh, traditional war, like doomsday clock. And uh, when the war goes out of control, the countries launch the rockets and, and it's done. But uh, what I want to state is that uh, the nuclear weapons, because we you know, I already used like multiple times in the conflicts, in the form of uh, conflicts in the form of uh, depleted, depleted uranium, and the final effects are clear. For example, on the example of the um, former Yugoslavia, um, and the damage is huge. So the question is that maybe we should switch our attention from the potential, but you know, uh, the, the the potential threat, but the threat which is you know like 
is uh, has not a, has not a big chance, uh, and switch it to the threat which is which we are facing, which we are facing already now. So maybe the question is again that maybe we should switch our uh, attention to the problem of the depleted uranium. That's it. So, so the first one is about uh, yes, Israel, and the second one is about non-commercial use of arms. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, the Israel-U.S. relationship is uh, the, when you were pausing. I was going to say complex. That's how I could use it. It's become more complex. Yes. Now, there's always been tensions there. Uh, the I mean, whenever the U.S. would force the Israelis to make a ceasefire, they were angry at Kissinger for that. They were angry when, uh, you remember, they, I think it was Carter locked up Bacon and Sadat and, 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 and forced them to sustain, and spend a week in Camp David until they got a peace agreement. They were both furious at that, the U.S. for that. Um, and that Clinton got into a big fight with the Israelis about the settlements. And then the nuclear deal. So I, I expect there'll be recurring tensions. Um, I would say, though, the Israelis are a bit divided on the nuclear deal. Um, there are many Israelis who support it. I mean, obviously, Israel ideally would like what the U.S. would like, which is Iran uh, gives up all its nuclear weapons, stops enriching uranium, doesn't have a nuclear program at all, and, but, you know, that, that's not going to happen. So we have to figure out what is acceptable. And there are many Israelis who think that this Iran deal, whatever its flaws, it's better than the alternative. Um, when you get a new president, I mean, Clinton, I, I, I suspect, yeah, you could probably see the same kind of policies towards the Middle East you saw under Obama, since she seemed to be pretty committed to implementing those when she was Secretary of State. So you will see clashes over settlements, um, but they'll be limited. And I think for now, the Israelis have accepted the nuclear deal. I mean, they have a right of veto, right? They could just send in their planes and bomb, or try and bomb Iran's nuclear program, and then Iran would respond by attacking Israel, and then the U.S. would be dragged in. I mean, um, and so it seems that they're we'll wait and see how this part with it works and, and what happens and what comes next. Um, Republican, I don't know. I mean, uh, it, it depends who it is, um, and the. the Front runner, I, I don't know what his views are because they change periodically on a lot of things, and so I don't know what would happen. I think it, I have to say that if Trump were elected, it'd probably be good for Russia-U.S. relations, but it would be bad for a lot of other things. So I don't know what the net effect is on Israel. What would it be? Uh, but okay, that aside, so we'll, we'll leave it at that. Um, um, the depleted uranium, I, you know, for it's not been covered in this because I, I think does people understand what what this is? I mean, basically, it's you in order to get an effective anti-tank weapon. You know, tanks have become much more stronger in field, and so you need something really hard that can go right through, punch through it. And depleted uranium, given its properties, does that. It's not radioactive, and it doesn't have a fissile material, so that's why it's not being considered a nuclear weapon. Um, and you can't take it and make a radiological weapon, a dirty bomb, because it doesn't, it's again, because it's not radioactive or anything. Uh, but because of the uranium label, and there are people, I just don't know, but there are people who claim, you know, they've had health problems because of, of being in contact with this stuff. But I think it's probably going to be like landmines or something that the, the United States and a couple other countries um, will say it's too important for our militaries. We're not going to, we'll limit its use, but we're not going to give it up. And, you know, so I think that's where we are. But I just don't know that much about it. I just know it's not normally considered in this in this domain. It's more, it, perhaps under the uh, uh, cruel conventional weapons or whatever that term is, or some kind of conventional weapons that people are trying to control. And I think that, that's where it is at the moment. We have another one here. 
Professor, and uh, closing our conversation, just a very small, very small question. Uh, who do you think, in your opinion, is going to have the nomination from Republicans and Democrats? Democrats, and who is going to win? Right, I'm, I'm terrible at predicting, so I wouldn't. I mean, so I wouldn't really rely on this. I guess I could feel comfortable saying that Clinton will win the Democratic nomination. <laughs> I don't know about the Republican. It looks like Trump will win. And and I think if it's between Clinton and Trump, I think Clinton will win. But I'm just like terrible at this, and so I'm not really the right person to, to predict. Didn't know that everybody yeah. saw Obama. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I didn't think I didn't think Obama would get elected. I didn't think Clinton you know, I was really proud of Americans. Whether you think whatever you whether you vote from not, I just I just couldn't think Americans would elect a black person president. I just did because I there's so much you know, the racism you know, I just, and, and and you know there's some people some people now wait for the women barrier to break, yeah. and I think we we should break that soon. Yeah, soon. But uh, you know, I didn't know. I didn't think Trump would do so well. I'm just not good at this. So, you know. um, I'm going to close with another question. Okay, right. um, not particularly uh, about nuclear non-proliferation, but uh, as I see a lot of young people here and a lot of people from the academia, um, maybe you could give us a piece of career advice in terms of. What do you think is the most important thing in studying international security? In terms of like uh, routine stuff researchers actually do. So is it uh, theory? Is it uh, factual knowledge? Is it uh, quant? Is it uh, qualitative analysis? Is it uh, access to classified documents? I don't know, whatever, or personal sources. What would you say is the your number one advice for studying international relations and global security? That's a really good question, which I've also not been very good at. I spent my early years studying the Soviet Union so I could, you know, there was a big program, we'd all learn Russian and so on so that we could, like, defeat the Soviet Empire. And then Gorbachev came along and did it for me. And so, <laughs> so well, I didn't have a country to, to study. Um, and so you hopped around. The one thing I do know is you, you'd be surprised. The fads change all the time. So, you know, after the Cold War, everybody was learning, you know, international economics or the new security threats. And then now with the revival, Every, I guess, and then oh no, that was 9/11. I was actually at the Pentagon. I saw the plane hit the building. Uh, and so, and, uh, anyway, and so then everyone went into terrorism and, and Islamic studies, and and for a while it looked like China studies were going to be the big thing. And you know, it's just all I know is it's just so hard to predict. So I wouldn't. Uh, you, I think you can safely do what interests you most, and you, it's probably as good as any advice because then you're gonna it's that your topic will come up. So if you're inter- you know, if you're really interested in, um, you know, as you are Southeast Asia, then you'll you know, pursue that. You'll be well good at it because you're interested, in it and then and your region may or may not be important, but it's not under your control. Um, and for whether security or IP or climate change, we just, I just you know this is there's no way we can predict it. It's somewhat random, it seems. So and just another very brief question: descriptive methods or quantitative methods? Yeah, that's a hard one. The field, if you want to become a professor of international, if you want to be a professor of international relations, then you have to do the quantitative, you have to do this, this, unfortunately I think the Americans have dumped this on your, your thing, because we've been, there's been a wave of quantitative, and then there was this, this like conformal methodology, I forget what it was called, and then there was a constructivism, I mean I think all these waves start out in the US academies, and then they get pushed onto Europe and Russia and so on, but <laughs> Then then they fade away. So I I you know I, I don't I don't know enough, but I do think if you're a professor, if you want to become a professor in relations, you need to show you know that stuff. You want to become a practitioner, you start talking about quantitative, you start talking about formal modeling, they will kick you out of the room very quickly. So if you want to advise the you know Ministry of General Affairs, or the Ministry of Defense, or sorry, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, then you, you make sure you can speak clearly. I think journalism is a good training for that. Make sure you can get a key points across very quickly in like five minutes but but it depends on you know whether you're some of them some of them you get you get lucky like Carter and Obama and 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 Clinton all like to sit around and talk for hours about some of the theories but they're like some who I suspect some I suspect Trump's like this he you talk that he, he won't listen to you he wants like a very short crisp message uh, so it probably depends and you know I don't know about Putin I've, I've listened to him and I've met I met him once in a crowd once, and he's very smart, so I imagine he can go for these four hour things, but I can imagine there are others on his entourage who won't wouldn't go for that. So 
Yeah, it's part of the benefit. Richard, thank you so much for coming and speaking to us today. Uh, I think it was a pleasure for all of us. Um, we learned a lot, I think, and there, we were leaving this conversation with a lot of thinking about. So, um, you're always welcome here in Moscow, here at the Russian Council. We'll be glad to host you again and discuss anything uh, ranging from uh, nuclear non-proliferation to uh, Donald Trump, perhaps the next year's president. <laughs> uh, but let's hope for a better future. Okay. Спасибо за гостеприимство. Thank you.